Alfred Poor, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thanks so much. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be talking to you. So there, a lot of people listen to this on audio, and not that many people watch the video, but today we're going to be talking about um, video, right? About how to present yourself and how to communicate in this online world. So I, I will, um, in the show notes, have a link to the YouTube, assu assuming this all records well, so people can actually see our our beautiful backgrounds and the, anything else that yep. turns out to be relevant. But first, before before we get into it, tell us a little bit about yourself and you know why folks should listen to you. Sure, sure. So um, I, I, I bill myself as the health tech futurist. I'm focused on health technology right now in my most of my dealings, I, I had uh, added a an industry newsletter about and, and website about wearable and mobile technologies for health and medical. But um, mm. my technology background goes way back. I, I wrote for PC Magazine for more than 20 years. Um, and after that, I was uh, a, a, an expert in display technology, particularly in televisions as we switch from analog to digital broadcasts. People were confused about that. Um, and now the health tech, basically I've made my career out of explaining stuff to people, primarily, tech, <laughs> primarily technology and explaining it in ways that they can use. So, uh -huh. you know, it's not so much the topic dependent as, as that skill of, of being able to understand the, the complexity of these things and trying to boil it down so that people have things that they can take action on and, and be effective with. Ooh, well, I, I suddenly had the urge to uh, to hijack part of the conversation to talk about wearables. Sure. <laughs> this is this is this is I'm 36 hours into my whoop, my first ever. There you go. Okay. Wearable, Excellent. other than a, you know a Garmin watch for running. So uh, yeah, uh, maybe maybe take a detour there. But but uh, let's let's start with the promise, sure. uh, which is hel helping people be more effective in presenting online and specifically uh, using video. So wh why is this even important? So uh, last year, about uh, March or so, a number of the speaker communities that I'm a part of, I kept seeing the same thing get posted. Somebody said, well, I just got the call. My last event for all of 2020 has been canceled. Um, I'm just gonna sit back and wait for 2021 to come around. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this year, this year is done, and the for me they were missing a point, uh, a, an opportunity, but but also something more fundamental than that, and that is that you know people talk about virtual events versus real events, which I don't think is is the right term. I think the right terms are on site or online, mm. because they're all real, they're all in person, they're all live. Um, it's just the the venue the the mechanism is different and the pandemic obviously forced us into far too many zoom meetings and you know couldn't travel and it and it changed the way people do did business and and obviously when you have a, a, a rapid inflection point like that people aren't necessarily prepared for it and that was especially true for speakers uh, i'm talking about professional speakers but you know they were prepared to, to speak on stage and they had their their skills and, and craft down, but that didn't translate necessarily to virtual, which is too bad because with virtual, you don't have to get on an airplane and go someplace and stay in a hotel a couple of nights to talk for an hour. Um, and it opens up all kinds of possibilities. Uh, one of the things that event organizers have discovered is that there some events are getting two, three, even 10 times as many participants when they hold a virtual event, an online event, than when they held it in person. Um, hmm. And so, uh, you know, for, for anyone who speaks to, to others, um, as a speaker, as an industry thought leader, as a, a business owner or executive, even as, as managers or, or salespeople, you know, if part of your job is is reaching out and and connecting with people and sharing information, um, you're cutting off a whole lot of opportunity if you're not ready to do a good job with a camera, as opposed to being at a lectern on a stage or in the front of a meeting room. And so that's that's how this all got started. 
obviously I've got the tech head technical background that goes way back. I've been doing online events for over eight years, um, doing them for myself as a paid speaker for other people's online events. I've produced summits uh, this uh, past year. I produced a whole series of online trade shows for consumer electronic companies. So this wasn't wasn't brand new to me. I wasn't jumping on a bandwagon. This, but so I had some things that I could share. And so I really wanted to encourage people to start wherever they are, but but be be better at it. Mm -hmm. So um, the bulk of the people watching and listening to this are not professional speakers. They're just sort of you know, ordinary people. Either have, they have jobs in which you know they've been zoomed. <laughs> Um, instead of real meetings, or a lot of folks are, um, you know, activists of one sort or another, or teachers who, you know, is, is what you're talking about also applicable sort of across the board for any of us who have a computer and a camera? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it, I think that the professional speakers are the ones who are kind of aware of this, but the, I think the rest of the population and the audience that you've just described tends to think, oh, well, you know, that's one more thing I have to learn a lot about that I have to spend a lot of time on that. I got to spend a lot of money on that. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just do good enough and, and let it go at that. And, and it's a shame because it's a missed opportunity. Um, I, I, whenever you have a, a, an inflection in an industry, um, there's that window where you can have a competitive advantage by being better. But that evaporates quickly, and very soon you need to be better just to stay even with everybody else. And and we're gonna we're gonna get to that point fairly quickly when it comes to having online conversations, whether it's one to one or or addressing a group of people. Mm -hmm. One of so, one of my favorite points is people talk about Zoom fatigue. Yeah, and I don't believe this that Zoom fatigue exists. I. I think it's a made up term. What I think there is, is bad Zoom fatigue, just hmm. like there's bad meeting fatigue. And we both, I'm sure, have been sitting through meetings around a conference table someplace, just staring at the ceiling saying, when will this end? Um, <clears throat> and it's not because you were in the meeting room, it's because the meeting wasn't well organized. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't orchestrated effectively. It, it didn't engage mm -hmm. the participants, um, whatever the point was. So it, it's not Zoom fatigue, it's bad Zoom fatigue. And my belief is that if you can stand out as being better at Zoom, then that's going to be a competitive advantage for you. Hmm. Um, so you mentioned that the pandemic has sort of been an inflection point, which sounds like you think we're not going back. Like when, you know, Delta's cured, everybody's vaccinated, something else happens, and we're all like, it, it's in the rearview mirror, we're still going to be living in a much more online meeting ish online event ish sort of world, we will go back to on site meetings, we will go back to having, you know, people gathering in, in small rooms, big rooms, ballrooms. And, and I don't doubt that. The difference is that we're not going to go all the way back to the way it was. And the reason for that is meeting planners, company executives, everybody involved in all these, these processes, they've already had a taste of the apple. They know how much time it saves. They know how much money it saves in terms of people not being out of the office or travel expenses or you know, all those kinds of things that add up. Um, there was a fascinating interview with the I believe it was the CEO of Tata, which is the giant conglomerate in India. The, the truck it, company? It goes across all the industries. They make uh -huh. cars and steel and everything. And early on in the pandemic, he said, I used to think that to make a deal, I would have to get on a plane and go someplace for a week. Um, and, and it would take two or three trips like that to close a deal. He said, I just closed a half billion dollar deal with three video calls, and I never had to leave my office. Um, and so that's just one tiny example. Um, but, you know, it, it's expensive for him <laughs> to go away mm -hmm. for that long. So, um, 
you know, that's just one tiny example of the benefits of online. And I, the reason I think people are hesitant to do it is because, again, they're not confident in it, how they, on how to do it. They, they feel that it, uh, they don't, aren't as engaging. You know, there, there's a number of things about the experience that's not as satisfying as, as it would be if they were in the face to face in the same room. And my point is that that's true for a lot of people, but it doesn't have to be true. There are things you can do to engage more effectively across the ether. Uh huh. So my first inkling of that was um, a friend's son's bar mitzvah, where you know you, you'd go to the. You, first of all, I wouldn't have gone because it wasn't near me. Uh, so now I was there. And they used technology. They had like, you know, they invited people to, to, uh, to write blessings that then got turned into like this word cloud that everybody could see, like, what are the key words that we're wishing for this child? It's like, oh, like there are like, all, before that point, I was just thinking of all the downsides. Like, you know, we're all disembodied. We can't like feel and smell each other's energy. There's, you know, there's no sort of sidebar conversations. And for the first time I thought, oh, there, you know, yeah, that's all true. And there might be some compensatory um, technologies that we could use in a different way. So that it's not that the, it's gonna ever replace a communal ritual, but it can be something else. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, it, if you try the big fault that, the big mistake that a lot of people make is they try to replicate that on-site in-person experience online. Mm. And, you know, and that's like saying, okay, I don't have a pickup truck. I've got a minivan, but I need to go haul stuff to my construction site. So how do I make the minivan look like a pickup truck? Well, it doesn't, you know, and, <laughs> and so you need to do the things that minivans are good for and not try to do the things that pickup trucks are good for. That's a great analogy because we we used to haul we we moved to a farm and I had a minivan and we were like hauling bales of hay and like twice a week I was vacuuming the minivan and I then I got a pickup truck with a plastic bed liner I'm like oh my god this is so much easier yeah yeah and 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 yet there are things you know if you would need to haul five or six kids to a soccer game and it's raining chances are the pickup truck's not going to be very good right. <laughs> Kids wouldn't mind, but uh, <laughs> right, <laughs> it's pro probably against the law. Probably, uh, well, yeah, it is now. Back in the day, we used right. to ride the back of pick truck, pickup trucks all the time, but that's it. Right, <laughs> that's another time and place. Yeah. So, um, I guess I, I kind of want to talk about. So, what what are the the you know what are the pickup truck or the you know the the pickup truck qualities of online whether it's a big event or just you, you and me talking or a small group meeting or somebody recording something for a LinkedIn Live or a YouTube show. Like, okay, so if we can't be there in person, then well, how do we think about that? What are we trying to do? What are we trying to replicate? And what are we trying to do differently? Exactly. And so for me, well, first of all, if you're going to an event um, as a speaker, or or you know you're going to some meeting in a in a either internal or external, there's going to be a conference room set up or something like that. The first thing is that for those kind of events where you're there in person, somebody else is taking care of everything for you. Somebody else turned the room lights on. There's a microphone set up. Somebody's already hooked up the microphone and put it in the sound system and gotten all the levels right, you know, if, if there's a stage, somebody's already dressed the stage and all those things. So the, the first thing to come to grips with is that nobody's going to do that for you when you're in your office, you know, either your, your, your office in a, in a building or if you're in a home office, you're going to have to cope with all those things yourself. And so for me, you, you start ticking down the hierarchy of the factors that are most important. And, and so for me, number one, without a doubt, is sound. People will do, put up with just about anything so long as they can hear what you're saying 
and and it's clear and the, the you know the volume level is up and 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 you know you've got good sound quality you know if you sound like an old am radio and a 57 ford um people are going to get very tired of that very quickly and they're going to click away mm -hmm. so the the a lot of people say well you know what do i do about that well there's a lot of things you can do without having to go you know full sound studio um you know simply buying a um a, a, you can get a really top quality microphone like the one i'm using right now for under a hundred dollars and that can make just an enormous difference over the mm -hmm. sound that you might get from your webcam or from your your laptop computer so is that a blue yeti this is a blue yeti that i'm using okay um now i in typical fashion um it i've uh amped it up a little bit um i like to work at a standing desk when i'm talking and have, uh -huh. we're having a video conference I, actually i work at a standing desk all the time there's no chairs in my office anywhere um uh one of the problems is that uh, the Yeti comes with a desk stand, which is nice, but if you tap your desk, that vibration comes through. And so if you're typing anything, you know, all that sound will come through the mic. So I've actually mounted it on a boom stand with a shock mount um, that it does add to the cost, but you know, probably less than $50 to, right. to add that. And when I, when I started out in podcasting, um i mean when, when i decided i was going to get real about it i bought an atr 2100 dynamic mic. it was under 50 bucks at the time it's probably between 50 and 100 now and you know there's there's like there's an entire online industry to kind of write reviews to get you to buy things off of their links and honestly like i've upgraded a couple of times since that mic and i can't even hear the difference mm -hmm. Like for, yeah. for, for 30 bucks, you can get enough quality that no one but, you know, an orchestra conductor or an audiophile is going to hear that you aren't yeah. right there in the room with them. And, and that's a really good point. Um, yeah, we're both musicians, I know. Um, and people, I play mandolin and people always ask me, what's the, you know, what, what mandolin should I get? I, I want to get started. Mm -hmm. And my advice is, Buy the lowest price mandolin that you can stand to play. <laughs> right? Um, make the minimal, minimum viable investment and work with that until you find that it's not doing what you want to do. You can't make the sounds that you want to make. You can't play the kinds of things you want to play on it. Then you know what you need. So then go look for the lowest price instrument that will let you do that. And, and upgrade to that one. But don't start off with a three or $4,000 custom built instrument because right. you, 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 know, you may not need that. Right. And it's the same with microphones. Start with you know, a, a, a minimally viable solution and work with it until you start hearing, oh, you know, that doesn't sound as good as I want. It doesn't have the, you know, the sound qualities that I want. Um, and there's a lot to know about it. There's dynamic versus condenser mics. There's you know a lot of USB versus going into a, a a soundboard that you can then adjust the sound levels on and and so forth. So you can definitely go up and up, you know, beyond the, that that minimal viable solution. But uh, but my advice is you know start at the bottom and then work up as you as you hear the need. Now I will say that a lot of stuff that sounds okay through your laptop speakers or your you know, your desktop speakers or on your phone. And you start listening to those through head, headphones, as I'm sure you do, um, especially if you're editing. Um, you can hear, I hear the difference. I hear a lot of difference. I mean, there's a lot of things about my sound that I, I don't like the way it is now and I'm, I'm working to fix that. But, mm -hmm. uh, but, but I think what I have now is good enough. Right. Right. And I mean, the other thing that I would say is that when you get a mic, learn your mic. Yes. Right. Because I, I mean, this is true of speakers at public meetings as well, that people, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like three inch, three and a half inches away from my condenser mic. If I turn my head to the side, all of a sudden it gets a lot quieter. Yep. 
and people don't you know when you get when you're speaking you get animated and you forget that you have yes. a, your primary relationship is with is with this microphone and i'd also point out that you're you're speaking over the top of your mic um a lot of people get down here and speak straight into their mic which for a condenser mic doesn't give you the best sound usually you mean However, i'm doing it right you're doing you're doing it absolutely right oh good but, but if you were using a dynamic mic like a, a Shure 58, which is the SM58, which is the, <clears throat> the gold standard for every garage band ever. Um, for that, they have it has what's called a proximity effect. So first of all, it's, it's very directional. So you want to be speaking straight into it. But the other thing, as you get closer and closer to it, you get that rich baritone kind of sound out of it that just, you know, sounds gorgeous. Um, but you back off three inches from that, and you lose it. So, mm -hmm. so you really need to experiment. Um, this is where GarageBand or Audacity is, is your friend because you just fire that up and talk into it and experiment and see what happens when you use different settings and change your position and all that. And mm -hmm. using headphones, you'll really be able to hear the difference and see which kind of sound you really want. Right. And the way I've done that is with, uh, you know, my co-author, Peter Bregman, okay, like, like most of the time we discuss like important things, but sometimes we'll just get on a Zoom call like he got this mic and then like we spend 10 minutes where he's just talking and moving back and forth. And is it better here? Is it am I better here? Yeah. Is it better with the uh, with the pop filter on or off? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you can you know get and somebody else to tell you before you before you have to do it for money. Absolutely. And that and that's a really key thing. Boy, I have. Just recently, I attended a, a, a live webinar by an expert. And it was, in my opinion, I mean, the content was pretty good, but the, the production was a disaster. They didn't have a pop filter. They were too close to the mic. They were popping their, 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 their P's and T's. And, um, and I was just so distracted by all those kinds of, kinds of problems. Um, that yeah, I, I'd had a had a real hard time paying attention to the content, which again is why you want to be that you know that incremental step better than the other guy, because you've got a you've got that much of an edge in being able to get your point across and 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 then making it stick. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So just uh, you know, I'm going to take advantage of this for for personal consulting. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, I have the pop filter, but I don't keep it on because it like visually it takes up more room. Do you think it's uh, it's necessary with me talking over the top of it? At this, I haven't noticed any any pops. And um, so Peter I, Piper I, picked a peck of pickled peppers. Yeah, it's, it sounds perfect. OK, um, at this point, I I have a wind filter, a windscreen and a pop filter on mine. Mm. Um, may not need them, but this way I, I don't have to worry about it. Um, my goal is to get rid of the mic altogether. Um, my goal is to go to a lav mic, lavalier mic. Uh, and I've, I've got a bunch here that are pretty good. The problem is that I need to do some sound treatments to my room uh -huh. because I, I've got an angled ceiling here, a hard wall behind me, a hard, hard, uh, ceiling overhead. And so I'm getting a lot of, of room noise, uh, with it. The thing about condenser mics is they tend not to pick that up as much as you might get with a, a dynamic mic. Um, so lavalier mics are dynamic. And so they are more omni and, and tend to pick all that up more. So until I can get some dampening panels, which I've built and are sitting right here waiting to go up, um, till I can get some of them up to uh, soften the, the room a bit, I'm going to be stuck using a big mic. But gotcha. on the other hand, for some people, for some situations, you know, it looks, it looks sexy. It's a big pro mic, um, right. you know, and people think you know what you're doing because you've got a, a big hunk of hardware. Right. I know when I'm, when I'm doing interviews with people and they, they, I first get on, they, they feel very relieved. Like, okay, he's got a mic. <laughs> right. <laughs> he's, he's not, he's not using his webcam. Right. Right. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, so, so what else? What else do people, yeah, sorry, before before we go on to the video, yeah. Yeah. anything else people need to know about 
audio that would be different than you would teach us a, a public speaker, like in terms of enunciation or breathing or pacing? No, it's, I mean, it's pretty much the same. When you're recording, um, especially with podcasts, and I'm sure you know that, uh, you often get the inhale, <sighs> you know, and it, it shows up. I frankly, I edit my podcast because I keep mine are nice and short and I can spend the time doing it. But I go out and I silence a lot of the, the inhales, not all of them, because I like it to sound natural and, and, and stuff, but it can be, it can be distracting. You can have the same problem on stage. It's mm -hmm. just less likely um, uh, to have that on stage. And also if it's audio only, you tend to hear things like that more when you just, you know, when you're watching a video, you don't hear it so much because you've got all the other visual cues going on. But for audio only, those those deep inhales are um, can, can be distracting. Well, when Peter and I did our media training before we started on the promotion train, the uh, the trainer asked me, "How come you make a clicking sound every time you speak?" Yep. Right. So, and then I started yeah, I started hearing it, and it was yep. driving me crazy. <laughs> it's it is a a learned behavior. It is very common. And once you are sensitive to it, you'll hear it all over the place. Um, and it's, I don't know why we do it, but it's just this sort of reflexive tongue click that we do. Um, and, and I know that I do it sometimes. Uh, it's, it is another, it, it almost never happens while you're talking. It's always be just before you start talking. And, and that's, that's when people do it. Um, right. It, it's not the it's not the um that fills in the middle of a thing. It it's that sort of trigger before you start talking, and and you can learn not to do it, but uh, but it's totally natural. I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> so you were you were about to talk about the webcam. So we're going to well, move, move to video. So so the next level in the hierarchy is is the image. So first of all, they've got to hear you and and not have to work hard to hear you. Second one is if you're doing video, same thing holds. You don't want them to have to work hard to hear you, to see you. And because that's really the, the most engaging part. You know, if you're listening to just audio, it could be a recording. There's, there's not that much liveness to it. You know, you can't, but when it's, when it's a, a video, you've got the, the eye contact, you've got the engagement, you've got motions to, you know, gestures to emphasize your points. So uh, all that adds up and makes it more natural and more engaging. Anything that gets in the way of that can be a problem because again, it's gonna be tiring for them to watch you. Um, so one of, one of the easy points, one of the big points that I make is that almost everything we've been taught about speaking on stage is wrong hmm. when it comes to camera because you know stage you're supposed to be big big gestures walk over here make your point come back over here anchor yourself make a point um all that kinds of stuff that doesn't work on camera you know so what i encourage people to do is don't watch stage performances watch television performances go to your favorite news channel and and how do they act and you'll see they sit very still. You know, they'll use their hands to gesture from time to time, but but for the most part, they're standing very still and not not moving around and making the audience seasick. Uh-huh. So so there are things like that. But you know, again, if it's hard to see you, that's gonna they're gonna get tired of that, they're gonna look away. And one of the big things there is the lighting. So you wanna, I mean. As I tell people, a lot of people know not to sit in front of a bright window because then you're all in shade and people won't be able to see your face and, and it doesn't, doesn't go over so well. So having you know, bright diffused light in front of you is, is a, a much better thing. Mm -hmm. How's my lighting? Uh, I'm sorry? How's my lighting? Your lighting is good. One thing that's, that's, that's really good about your lighting is that you have a little more light on one side than the other. Uh-huh. And that's and that's 
provides some dynamic range to your face and makes it more engaging and, and more attractive. Um, one of the things that a lot of people do is they'll put a bright light in front of them mm -hmm, right. and it will light their face evenly. And it's kind of flat. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's like talking in a monotone. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't give that much depth and, and dynamic level to your, to your face when you do that. Okay. Cause I have two sort of bright LEDs in front of me on stands, but I also have um, soft boxes up that are actually a little, one's a little bit in front of me, one's a little bit behind me that are shining onto the back. Yep. Um, Those, that I, sounds like a very good setup. I, I have two soft boxes there and I have one overhead to provide a little more definition from, from up on high. Uh -huh. um, uh, there, there are lots of videos on YouTube about different ways you can set up your lighting, but you know, a, a simple three point lighting is, is generally really good uh, for, for what most people need. Right. And now, again, so, so much easier. I start, I started making videos in 2004 and I, I bought a lighting kit that was, you know, it was a, the size of a steamer trunk with, <laughs> you know, three, um, it had, it had actually had, it had five, um, tripods, mm -hmm. you know, then all the lighting stuff, and this was 500 watt, <laughs> Yep. Um, incandescent bulbs that you'd be sweating as soon as you turned it on. And they only yep. lasted for a couple, you know, 20, 20 hours and they were very expensive. And then the, um, the, the two um, tripods with the backdrop stand, and this thing, this yep. whole thing was like 500 bucks and, yep. and constant ongoing maintenance. And it was huge. And it was a huge pain to put up and take down. And now these lights I have here, they're on $20 stands that clamp onto my desk each one of these was 50 bucks and they're way brighter and they're LED 50, 50 watts and they yep. don't you use very little energy. Yeah. I, I, LED is the only way to go clearly. And, and you have a number of really good choices for lighting between a hundred and $150. Um, uh, and uh, the, the panels like you suggested, but you can also still get soft boxes within that price range. The, the soft boxes I have have, take five bulbs originally they had uh the ccfl the yeah. sort of corkscrew fluorescent tubes in them um which were which were great at the time because they use a lot less power energy than the, the the incandescent but they still got hot and the bigger problem with them is they change brightness over time when you first turn them on they were one level and then slowly they'd warm up and then it would drift a little bit you know your white colors would change white levels would change it, it was just mm. it was maddening they um, also they also hum sometimes sometimes they can hum exactly <laughs> so my solution is i've re replaced all those ccfls with just standard led light bulbs um and these are ones i get at the big box store for two or three dollars a piece um, they're the brightest I can get. So they're the 100 watt equivalent. And the big thing is I get daylight color temperature bulbs because I, I think that cooler light looks more professional. I think it gives, gives you a better image that, you know, the warm light is kind of yellow, which depending on what you're doing, that might be fine. But I think for a professional kind of look, I, I think that the daylight gives you a much better look. Okay, gotcha. Uh, so um, before we go on to... Um, cameras you talked about like tv so how do you think about the framing like if i was on stage i wouldn't want them to see my whole body and i know you could you know some people yeah. could do that like if you know if a yoga teacher obviously doesn't just want to be a talking head but for you yeah. know for you and i at a, we're both at standing desks yeah. i have you know i have a camera that has zoom i could zoom in and you could just you know, see the whites yep. of my eyes, or I could zoom out. You could see the sides of the room, you know, beyond the blue background. How, how should I think about that? So great question. Great question. And so again, don't ask me, go watch television. Um, but this is what you're going to see. One of the things that drives me crazy is the number of, you know, Zoom meetings or, or, or podcasts or whatever that I'm, I've been on. And you see this. Somebody down here <laughs> got all this space up here and they're down here talking, um, which, you know, it just, it's not a good look. 
But what's worse is when they're all the way forward. And so, you know, it's framed. So it's just, just their face and, you know, mm. neck in, in the image. And I was on a, a call with a, a psychologist um, who's done a lot of research in this area. And he made a really good point. He said, you do that, you're violating the audience's space. You're too close. Mm. You know, they're going to want to back, back away from you, you know, and, and that's, that's not a good reaction to, to set up with people. I have a, a number of people I know who that is their go-to look. Fill the phrase, you know, fame, you know, they're being intimate, um, you know, and, and mm. all that. And, and I just think, I think it's a mistake. Um, okay. My rule of thumb is you want to show at least from the bot, you know, the, the bottom edge of your rib cage up. Uh -huh. And you so also not, don't want to I'm cut off quite, the top of your head. Right. So I'm not quite doing that. So, so I was saying, yeah. you've got, I can see your elbows and I can't see yep. mine. And so, so to me, the bottom, the bottom limit is about the belt. So, okay. so you so want the I bottom of the image. Get if out I of move the backwards here. a little bit. So from here, you know, down to about here, I think is about the right framing. Uh-huh. So does this, you, this, does this look so better? That's, that's better. And I think, you know, I think if you could be just back a little further, that would be even better. Okay. So then the, the limiting factor is the mic. Right. So I can, I can move it. I'm not going to do it right yeah. now. No. Do I still but, sound yeah. okay? Play, play um, around with Yeah, it, it's good. Okay. But, um, but I would say from a framing point of view, that looks much better. Uh-huh. Okay. It looks more natural. And so the psychologist was saying, for every additional L, you know, proportion of the, the torso that you show on screen, uh -huh. the higher the engagement goes, the more human you become. Uh -huh. Which, and, and it's not just his theory. I mean, that's, they've done studies and this is what they found. So, uh, and this is why I wanna to go to a lav mic because then I'll be able to step back even further. I can move around more and my sound will be good. You know, I won't have to, I won't, I won't be anchored to the microphone as I am now. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I have a couple of lav mics, but they're not very good. They were uh, right. sort of $50 a pair. Yep. Uh, so would you get a wireless? No, no, I'm, I'm a wired guy. Well, first of all, you know, you run it down your shirt, the wires out of the frame, no one's going to see it. It's not going to look any different wired or wireless. You don't have to worry about charging. You don't, you know, there's a lot of headaches mm -hmm. with wireless that you don't have to worry about. Yeah, I, I, um, going back to a fundamental technology thing, I don't do Wi-Fi for my uh, connection. I, right. I'm on a wired Ethernet connection um, because you just don't know <laughs> what interference is going to come in and disrupt your your you know your Wi-Fi connection. So wired is better than 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 Wi-Fi if you can possibly do it. And you can get ethernet cables that are 100, you know, 100, 200 feet long. So I don't care if your router's in the basement. Right. You can and they're, still they're, run a wire up to your, to your room and, and, and have a wired connection. Yeah, they're pretty cheap. And they're not expensive, exactly. Perfect. One less thing to worry about. And, yeah. and, you get, and you get more bandwidth. And more bandwidth is higher resolution, better sound quality. I mean, it just all adds up. Right. So just, just for my own sake, I don't know that my sure. audience cares about this, but uh, what, <laughs> what lav mic should I get? Because I, I, really, I really like, I mean, I would love to not yep. have this thing in frame and I would yep. love to be able to move around more. So um, I, I've got the two, for, the two for 50 that I'm working with. I also have an old Sony stereo one that's a bit large and clunky. Um, my approach is I'm going to go with the, the cheapos until I find that it's not, doesn't give me the sound that I want. Um, obviously Rode, R-O-D-E, is one of the vendors who uh, makes great portable uh, uh, microphones and other portable equipment, recording equipment. Um, they're really good. Um, and, and there's, you know, there's nothing better than Shure, Shure you know, and they've got, they've got lab mics. So if I were going to upgrade, I would probably be looking at one of those two. Gotcha. And then, and then you've got a bunch of Chinese companies that um, put out really good stuff at, at, at a, a better price. So, you know, if you, 
willing to burn a little money just to try something out. Newer is one of them, N-E-W-E-R um, mm -hmm. on Amazon. Uh, but yeah, um, but again, I would start start with the, 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 the minimum viable and use that until you, until you decide that's not what you need. Very good. All right, so we've talked about sound. Yeah, microphones, and if yep. you're getting started, just get a U USB that plugs right in. You don't have to yep. worry about um, audio interfaces or sound boards. Yep. That's that's under hundred bucks. Lighting, hundred hundred fifty bucks. Right. We've got, um, we've got one point on lighting that we didn't cover. Okay. Ring lights. Now, uh -huh. if you don't, for those in the audience who don't know what a ring light is, a ring light is a circular light that's designed so that you could put your camera right in the middle uh, and, and shoot through it and get a nice even lighting on your face as you, as you record your video. Um, and in general, ring lights are, are a good idea. Um, however, don't use them the way they're designed. <laughs> uh, because again, if you put it right, if you put it right around the camera, then that light's going to be even across your face and you're not going to get that differential lighting and, and it's, not going to, it's not going to be as good as it could be. So what I recommend to people is take that ring light and mount it separately off 20, 30 degrees off axis from where the camera is. So you get a little more on one side and a little less on the other side. Not so okay. much that you get deep shadows on, one, on, you know, on the off side, but uh, it'll, it'll give you a better quality image. Gotcha. And if you and if you only have one stand, you can take, take a piece of paper and cover right. half of it. Right, right. <laughs> um, and then the other thing about it is people often buy a ring light that's too small. Because if you mm -hmm. think about, you know, getting a six, eight inch ring light, it's really not a whole lot bigger than a bare bulb. So right. you're not really getting much of a dispersion advantage of it so for me you really want at least a 10 inch ring 10 to 12 inches is better um, and again you also want to make sure that a uh, daylight uh, a daylight color temperature is one of the options and then the gotcha. third point about ring lights is there is a class of people who should never use a ring light ever oh yeah you are not in that class but i am because you wear glasses because i wear glasses and uh -huh. if you put a ring light out in front, you're going to get these little white Cheerios <laughs> in your in your, your your lenses. And I got to tell you, I I find that so distracting. Um, you know, I just, you can't you can't unsee it once you start noticing it. Um, and so if you have glasses, you're much better off just going with the, the two separate lights. And they don't have to be soft boxes. I mean, they could be a good floor lamp or a, a bright light. Um, Go down to Home Depot, buy one of these. If the light's too harsh, you can just put a. And for my for my for my listeners, it's basically like a a, 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 clamp, a clamp on utility a, light. Clamp on utility light. There, they cost the big ones are like seven dollars and ninety eight cents without yeah, the bulb. At, at the big at the big box, they're now running about thirteen fourteen dollars. Okay, but so it shows you when I, when I bought mine. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they, you know, but again, put one of these daylight LED bulbs in there. And, and, and this is also good for an auxiliary if you're trying to fill in someplace where you, you've got a little, a little shadow and you want to punch up the light. Or if you want to put more light on your backdrop, uh -huh. right. um, they, they can be very helpful for that. Okay. So before we get to cameras, one other question around position, mm -hmm. um, which is like, I'm looking into your eyes right yep. now yep. and I'm not, <laughs> yep. right? If I was actually looking, if I was pretending to look into your eyes so that you would think yep. that I am, I'm looking up about five inches from your head into my camera. Yep. So Peter and I were playing around with this and he actually got a, um, a, a teleprompter. Yes. That he, he pop, like, do you think that's useful or worth it? Like, is the difference like when I'm looking oh, at goodness. you or <laughs> like, you no, set him up so I can knock him down. This is great. Um, Okay, we'll get we'll talk more about this in cameras, but the key point is you want to put your camera at eye level or slightly above. 
because okay. that's naturally how you look oh. at people. I mean, you're not naturally looking down at somebody. Okay. You know, you, unless they're, you know, if they're seated and you're standing, but that's not, that's not a natural conversation or you don't look up to somebody, right? right. For a conversation, you want to be equals and, and looking eye to eye to each other. And you're right. In order to make it work, you should be looking right at the camera, which is what I'd, I'm doing as I'm looking at you. Okay. My screen is down there. Uh huh. I've built myself what I call the periscope. It's it's my my own um, do it yourself teleprompter. So what I've actually done is I built myself a full screen teleprompter that that fits over my monitor entirely and then reflects it up and my camera is behind the plastic where it gets reflected. Huh, so you can see me. I'm looking straight at you on my screen and, uh -huh. and my camera is right there. I'm looking at the camera while I'm looking at you. Okay. So I know you can buy stuff like this for like, yep. you know, like 200 bucks for They're the teleprompter. They can be expensive. Um, um, they, they can use some very fancy materials. And you know, the only reason I did this was because I have a shop and I'm just kind of bent this way. And um, I know enough about displays and optics to come up with something that, that's good enough. Okay. Um, Do you think it one matters? Of the, one, of the like... things, one of the things that's important is the mirror that you use to reflect up. You don't uh -huh. want to use a regular domestic mirror because they're silvered on the back. They have the reflective surface on the back. So the light comes through and hits the back and then comes back out again and it gets refracted. And so you don't get a really clean image. What you want is a front surface mirror. And I got this for free because somebody was throwing out a projection television screen and I went in and salvaged the, the mirror out of it. Okay. Um, so and that's an they... expensive part. I mean, to buy okay. that would be, would be not prohibitively expensive, but it's expensive. And that's why a lot of the teleprompter gear that you can buy online tends to be very small. They tend yeah. to be designed for iPads or you know, little tablets. Um, and, but the bottom line is they all work, you know, and that's, and that's good. And there are ways for you to get your image from your computer onto a tablet in your, uh, in, in a teleprompter. So my, my answer to all of, you know, long way around the barn is yes, teleprompter kind of arrangements are awesome. They, they, I believe they really make a difference and I think they really help with engagement. You don't have to have one. Um, uh, you have to learn how to be comfortable to talk at the camera and not look at the other person. Uh huh. Um, like I, I would think that you know, for me, when I've given, you know, group presentations to so like a Zoom uh, webinar where yeah. I'm just talking, then that's probably a better time to be looking at the camera. Yes. Whereas if it's a meeting and I actually, you know, or I'm teaching a class and there's ten people in the class, then it's more important for me to observe, you know, f f facial expressions, physical reactions. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that's if you do a lot of that, that's where a teleprompter kind of arrangement would be really good, because then you can have them in your field of view while you're talking. All right, cool. And, and, All right, so and so that could that can definitely be worth it. Okay. So, <clears throat> all right. Next next question. It looks like to me like you have a green screen. I do. Like that brick wall behind you with a post with a framed picture that says speaker. The oh, witch. it went away. <laughs> oh, now now you're like in the Bodleian Library, and and you have a um, bottom third, a bottom third that says it says your name and your thing. So what are you what are you using for this? Is this uh, Elgato? Uh, this is um, so Elgato is a, a, a manufacturer that makes wonderful equipment for um, for podcasting, for video, for you know, all kinds of things and, and basically turns your computer into a video control room, which is, which is great. Um, by itself, it doesn't do what I'm doing, all right? I'm using a, a program called OBS Studio. Okay. Uh, which is open source, it's free. Um, it is tricky. <laughs> I mean, it can do a lot of really great stuff, but 
there is a significant learning curve involved in in, in, in learning how to make it make it do stuff like this. Um, I don't have it set up right now for our conversation, but this um, LED, you know, the, the, this display I have over my shoulder is totally virtual. Ah. And, and when I'm doing a slideshow, my PowerPoints show up in here. And then I hit some keys and the PowerPoint fills the screen and I'll be down in the corner uh -huh. and I can add myself or take myself away from the, the PowerPoint screen and back again. And I'm doing that without any Elgato control panels. Um, okay. OBS uses allows you to set up keyboard macros. And so I have a bunch of keyboard macros that I can can use to make things appear and go away. Gotcha. Um, so I, what I what I use, I, I don't do very much of that at all. Yep. Um, basically, you know, for the podcast and also for presentations. Um, well, I want to talk to you about that as well, because I have a lot. Of, I have a big problem with showing my slides, but I'm mm -hmm. using, I use Ecamm Live and I have an A10 mini. Yep. Uh, and to some extent they, they duplicate each other's capabilities. Yeah. Uh, but let me, all right, let me ask you this. So I'm, I have, you know, I'm on camera here. I'm, I'm going yep. through, through Zoom and the A10 mini, the Blackmagic A10 mini is my source. Right. And I can, I have a button there um, that if I press, it gives me desktop. Yep. Uh, I don't know why it's not doing. I guess I'm. No, that worked. No, it, it changed the desktop. I I saw your desktop oh, okay. when you did. Oh, that. right, because I'm looking at the camera, not uh, right. Okay, so <laughs> so from there, I would then have my PowerPoint all all yep. keyed up and ready to go. Yeah. And then when I do that, people tell me, "Hey, it's blurry." Yep. Right. Yep. So, um, you know, the only thing I could do is then sh like not use these wonderful capabilities and then just do screen sharing on zoom which is now i gotta lean over and press buttons and it's kind of uh yep. like is now, there is there any any is there any way around that i haven't worked with the a10 mini but i i don't have that problem with obs studio because this isn't using my webcam zoom is using the obs studio virtual camera okay so i'm so the, so when i add well, actually let me i don't know i don't think i have anything set up here but let's yeah. Um, All right. I'm now no. seeing a, 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 you're gone and it says health tech inside. Yeah. Yeah. This that's always oh, like, that's the wrong one. Hang on. There we go. This. So this is where, if I had slides running, you'd see the slides behind me. Okay. Now you're at the bottom left. You're, yep. you're smaller. Yeah. And <laughs> so there's you... room, room out here. Well, my hand disappears, but there's, there's room out there. <laughs> somewhere. Right. There's right. room out there for all my, all my my PowerPoint content, uh huh. And this is and very if, this is very stark and, and if, cinematic. If, if, and if I need to get out of the way because I have you know a whole picture, you know, full screen picture or something like that, I can just I can just hide myself. Uh huh. Gotcha. Um, so but, so this is this is more for you know professional speakers, people who do presentation where they really want to wow an audience. I, I, yeah, I wouldn't say professional speakers. I think it's people who really want to wow an audience or who do a lot of presentations that are similar and have and and that this would augment the content and help mm -hmm. keep the audience's attention like if i were a salesperson you know and i was making sales calls on on video i would have a rig set up like this you know so i could call up a video you know that i could you know, make my sales pitch with slides. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, if you put slides in, in that little window that, you know, they're not going to show up much. It's mm -hmm. just for, you know, well, but really, and all really of this, content. all of this just gives the impression of competence. And it does that as well. Right. And then this is where I'm talking about today. This gives you that edge, right? Next year, certainly the year after this will be table stakes. Uh-huh. Gotcha. People, people will expect something of this quality. Right. Um, another question. I can't remember what it is. Oh, the green screen. The so, green screen. Yeah. So I, I, I assumed when you left, when you would, you know, get out of, hide the virtual background, that I was going to see an actual green screen, because on Zoom will do a green screen for you, and people's body parts keep disappearing. Okay. So. So yeah, okay. I'm glad you raised that up. 
okay, this goes back to Zoom fatigue or, you know, there's no such thing as Zoom fatigue. There's bad Zoom fatigue. And so are green screens good? Not necessarily. Good screen, green screens are good. Bad green screens, bad virtual screens are awful. And um, using Zoom and a bunch of the other platforms that allow you to do a virtual background without having to have a green screen behind you. Yeah, I mean, they work. Kind of. Mm -hmm. um, but what are you, what are you using? Because you don't, you don't have, you don't have an actual green screen. No, I do. Yeah. It's, it's an actual green screen behind. Me. It is. Well, what, what yeah. happened? I saw those books. That was just another, that was another, that's another background. Oh, can I see your green screen? Um, <laughs> probably. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> let me so, see if I can, what happens if I turn it off? What do we got now? No, I still see that the, the, uh, the neat desk with the tech. Logo. Uh, okay. It's not. It's not that important. <laughs> well, let me let me go here. Well, there there you. Okay, I can see you, the you, edge. It looks you like you can see the edge of it. it that the green screen is has um. Looks there black. We go. Let's see if that. No, that didn't bring it back. Okay. Um. So I see. Yeah. I see a black screen. So, which, so what you see is black is actually green. Okay. And you can see the, over here, you can see the edge right. of the screen and the clamps holding it in place. But this, this fabric right here is green. Okay. Gotcha. So, so now, so now what do you think of my, um, my background? This is my actual background. That's a, that's a real background. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let me, well, okay. So let me just finish on the, the thing about virtual backgrounds, a bad yeah. virtual background is, can be really distracting. Okay, um, right. You know, your hair appears and disappears and, you know, a bunch of stuff like that. And so I, I recommend against that. Um, uh, it just doesn't, it doesn't look professional. It's fine. You know, it's fun. It, you know, it's good enough for, for casual stuff, but if you're trying to, be professional. I mean, if this is something you would dress up for, then I wouldn't use one of those, you know, on the fly virtual backgrounds. Okay. So, um, so for your background, uh, there's a, hang on a second. Let me just hope, see if that should stop ringing. Good. Um, so a couple things I like about your background. Um, it's, it's bright. It's well lit. Um, it's, you know, it's a, a bookshelf, it's got some plants, it's, you know, it sort of makes things a little softer and nice. Um, I would see if I could get rid of some of the wrinkles in the, in the fabric. You can see the wrinkles? Yeah. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. Okay. It's all right. It's all right. But all right, I'll get more, more uh, brads more and a hammer. <laughs> but a um, uh, couple things that I really like is there's a, a, an effect in photography called bokeh, uh -huh. which is where it's depth of field, where you're in focus, but the background isn't. It's sort of blurred out a little bit, uh -huh. um, which is what I've got going on here. Right. Right. Um, and when this is, I think it's especially important when you're going to show a bookshelf. Because I don't know about you, but when I'm watching the, the news, and a commentator comes on and they're sitting in front of their, their bookshelf. Yep. Now, obviously, the, the book that they wrote is going to be facing us with a cover and their name on it. But then they've got all those other books. And I don't listen to a word they say. I'm busy there trying to read their books. And, you know, what do they think is important? What are they yep. reading? Um, and, and again, major distraction. This picture that I'm using for my backdrop, um, this isn't the original picture. I took this into Photoshop and I blurred it and blurred it and blurred it down and down and down until you didn't have a chance of reading any mm -hmm. of the titles. Right. So you're not even tempted to. And again, having that out sharper, you know, it provides a nice contrast and I think it works really well as a background. Um, wouldn't do you much good <laughs> if I hadn't blurred it because they're all in Spanish, but um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I, um, so that's what I like that about your, your, uh, your bookshelf is, you know, I'm not tempted to try to 
read the titles. Okay. If it was, if it was mm. much sharper, then then that that could be a distraction. Um, I think that the the key points about a good um, about a uh, a good background is that it's it's not cluttered. It's it it's got a rel a context that's relevant to your messaging. Uh -huh. um, uh, and so that it's, you know, it's got something that, that makes sense with what you're trying to do. Um, no, that, that one, I don't have set up and I don't have that one set up, right? Change, change cameras recently. So don't have all my different backgrounds queued up yet. Um, but yeah, so uncluttered, uh, makes sense in the context and it's not a distraction. I think those are the key things, but I, yeah, I think, I think yours works really well. It's okay. It's almost symmetrical. You know, it's not too uh -huh. symmetrical. I mean, I, some of the ones on TV look so great, but everything is just lockstep. Uh -huh. You know, you could just divide it right down the middle and fold it and it would match up exactly. Um, so I, I think, you know, you want a little, little unbalanced to it, which you've got. Okay, cool. So I'm looking at the time. We're already at the at past when I promised we'd be done, but I still have more questions. Do you have a few more minutes? Sure. Okay. So let's let's talk about I, the so you know I can go on. Obviously, I can go on about this stuff for hours. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, I will I will fully take advantage of your of your <laughs> your generosity or your inability to stop, whichever one no, whichever one this that, that represents. It, it, I, I don't know that there's a difference. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's talk about cameras because that's what people sure. think of think of first. Um, you know, there's the webcam that's that comes with your laptop. There's yep. your phone camera, which is way yep. better than anything I'd ever owned before. I yep. have a couple of DSLRs um, yep. that are they're cheap for DSLRs. They're both in the six hundred dollar, yeah, seven hundred dollar. That's about the the opening point for for a good DS, DSLR these days. Uh -huh. So what what do you what do you right. tell, tell people so, if they're they're just starting out and they've just got a laptop or they've got yeah. like a you know so, a Logitech six fifteen yeah. or something? We'll start with it. We'll start with a laptop. So going back a ways, cameras should be eye level or a little bit higher. That's hard with a laptop. It's hard with a laptop. You we we the, the phone company doesn't send out phone books anymore, so you need to find <laughs> something else to stack them on, right? Uh -huh. And so people take crates and they'll put it up so it's high enough for your uh, for your laptop camera to be up where it needs to be. But the problem then is you can't see your keyboard, mm -hmm. and if you do type on it, your hands are up in in the in this you know in the in the the shot, which is not good. Um, you can get these stands, thirty forty dollars, um, a stand that lifts the base off the the desk. And then puts it at an angle, and then the screen sticks up above that, so that gets the camera up high enough. Um, and so you can type on the screen, and the camera's up there, and and that can work. But let me just ask you: you I mean you're you're framed nicely now. How far are you from your camera? Um, three feet. Three feet. If that was attached to your keyboard, would you be able to type on your keyboard? I would not. I would need a yeah, separate yeah. Ex separate keyboard or sure. I mean, usually I stopped typing on the keyboard because the noise was annoying. Yeah. So now I just use a pen and pad and right. try and, and hope to God I can remember what, I, you know, what I wrote because my right. handwriting's not so great. <laughs> but now since talking to you, I'm farther away because my camera is attached by a, via a stand yep. to the desk. So right. I can't I can't move the camera back right now. Right, right. So now so, now I don't have you know, now I can yeah. dance and free float, but I can't <laughs> I can't operate my my desk. Right. So so for those with laptops, even though you've got a even though you might have a good camera built in, it might be a crappy camera. That's where I recommend you get an external camera, an external webcam. And Logitech is the 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 gold standard for for you know webcams. Um, the one I'm using right now is the C922 Pro. Okay. Basically, anything in the 9200, uh, you know, 920 series will probably do a, a really good job for you. 
Um, is that a green box? Because I could it, see the. Uh, oh, the green I, box. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it's a green box. Okay, so I, I could see the bricks through it. It's a virtual box. Uh -huh. <laughs> Good eye. Um, so, um, and again, last year, if you could find one that you you you'd paid a, a king's ransom. You know, there was price gouging going on like crazy. But today you can get that, oh, you know, about $100 for, uh -huh. for a good webcam. Um, some people will say, okay, what about the Logitech Brio, which is a 4K webcam? Um, 4K being twice, but actually works out to uh, almost four times the number of pixels as a standard full HD 1080p camera, which is what the 922 is. Um, Brio is 4K, higher resolution. Maybe I should get that because more pixels better, right? Don't waste your money. I mean, if you're gonna be recording videos with it and you have some reason why you need the higher resolution, fine. But no streaming platform that you're gonna be using is gonna show 1080, is gonna show 4K. A lot of them don't even show 1080p. Uh, Zoom will often step you down to 720p. So mm -hmm. there's no spent sense in spending the extra money for the 4K Brio. What the image quality you're going to get from the 922 is going to be just as good. Okay. So, right. Um, so some, something I discovered when I, you know, and I have a 920 that yep. um, I gave to my wife to use for her videos. And then I had, uh, I wanted, I set up a temporary office and I had two 615s, mm -hmm. which are old, like 10 yep. years old, maybe. And I was amazed at how bad they were yeah. and, and how good they got once I had proper lighting. Yes. So the bottom line for all webcams is more light is better. You know, I mean, you know, think about the movies or television. Those studios are bright. They're Sahara, <laughs> Sahara at noon bright um, because the more light you send in the lens, the more signal gets to the, to the, the, the imager. Um, and so more light is better. Um, it, it, there is a point where it's too much light. In fact, I actually have all these back down a notch or two. Um, I'm not using them at full brightness. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, more light is better. The, and, and the older cameras can be good enough. Um, uh, you wanna make sure that you're running them at their native resolution. So you're not scaling up or down because that mm -hmm. can make it blurrier. Um, and a lot of the, the older ones have some weird native resolutions, um, you know, 11, 11, 42 or something like that by something or other. I mean, it's, uh, if they're old enough, they can, they can be a little funky. Um, but, okay. but, but you, yeah, uh, it's, you know, good enough, stick with it. But you know, that could be one of the first targets to upgrade because again, hundred dollars should. So yeah, so so for somebody who wants to do it professionally, I think you yep. know, DSLR is kind of the, the either DSLR or mirrorless. Yeah, right. Well, mirrorless the is the way, Mirrorless is the way I would go. Uh -huh. um, and up until the past year or so, you had to take the HDMI output. From the camera and run it through a box that could then plug into your USB port. Uh, today, most of the big manufacturers have a feature so you can actually run an HDMI to USB cable directly from the camera to the computer. Um, some have uh, some have limitations that the others don't, but for the most part. Um, for this kind of stuff, it's going to be, uh, it, it's going to be plenty. You know, mm -hmm. none of the limitations are going to be a problem for you. The big thing is you want to be able to produce what's called a clean HDMI stream. So it, you know when you normally take a, a photo with your camera, it's got the f-stop and the shutter speed and the color temperature and how many shots you've got left and all kinds of other stuff on the yeah. screen. Yeah. You need to be able to have a setting where you 
you take all that away. So none of that goes through to the, the computer. That's uh, why I ended up buying a second camera. Because yeah. I have like this camera was absolutely my absolute favorite. It was the, the Canon uh, SL2, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have clean HDMI out. And the only yeah. way that I could get it was to turn off autofocus, right. which meant that I was now, <laughs> you know, stuck, stuck in place. So interesting you say that. My, so, so for those who don't know, the, the reason to step up to a DSLR or mirrorless DSL, DSLR, um, the reason to step up to them is they have interchangeable lenses and they have better optics. I mean, you look at the lens on, on a webcam, it's this tiny little dot. You look at a camera, you know, they've got an inch or two across on the lens. So you know, it's much better optics, a much better image that you get. And the fact that you can change lenses means that you can get a shorter <clears throat> focal length or a longer one so that you can get a telephoto or a wide angle. And, and so you can change the lens to, to meet the specific needs of your studio. Um, another thing is that these cameras are better, What that thing I was talking, talking about, bokeh. So where you can have the person in focus, but things closer and further away will be out of focus, which can give you a really nice look, um, especially if you're using a real and not a virtual backdrop behind you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my inclination is to turn autofocus off, okay? Because it's one more thing to go wrong. And the chances are good that you're gonna be staying in a fairly tight range of distance with the camera. You're probably not gonna, you know, you, you need to play around with the f-stops and the rest of that. Um, but depending on your lighting, you'll probably be able to, to find a range of focus where you're going to be and it'll, it'll stay in focus because huh. the problem is if you go autofocus and you, I mean, you know, some people are demonstrating stuff and they want to hold this up and have it get focused and then right. put if it you're back doing, down. If you're but, doing lots of product videos, yeah. you, you, you want one of those. But, it, but if it stays focused there and it doesn't come back to you, then you're a blur and then you have to go put your hand out here and bring it back slowly to get it catch up to you and, and all that. And that can be a mess. Um, my preference, and this goes for webcams, goes for digital cameras, it goes for all of them. I prefer to turn everything off. No automatic anything. I mean, one of the things that drives me crazy on Zoom calls and, and things where people are using their webcam, a lot of times the webcam will have auto exposure turned on. And I was in this one call where the woman was wearing a fairly crimson, uh, sweater on the call, which was pretty, but it would flash between crimson and magenta and crimson <laughs> and magenta back and forth. And it was again, really distracting. Um, uh, and uh, even if you just you know, have something, you, for whatever reason, you, you hold up a white piece of paper, if you have auto exposure on, it can change your color settings, it can change everything. And then you take the paper away and maybe it resets and maybe it doesn't. And so for me, I turn off auto exposure. I turn off, um, uh, I turn off the, the autofocus, anything that, yeah, you know, <clears throat> let me set up everything the way I want it and lock those controls in and, and I'll take my chances with being out of focus briefly. You know, I mean, you don't have to hold this up way up there. You know, you can show your product here and it's gonna be staying in focus because it's with you. Very good. Okay. And so do you have a camera that you, you know, people who don't want to go and like do a lot of research like a, yeah. A, a, yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm still shopping for buying. Um, uh, uh, Canon has some models that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very tempted by. Uh, Sony has some good low end models that will do the job. They, until the last year or so, there have been concerns about them overheating when used as a webcam, as mm. opposed to just, you know, video or, or, or snapshots. Um, and then the third one is the Lumix from Panasonic. Uh -huh. um, that's, uh, that one is also on my list. So those, those are the three brands I would look at first. The thing to remember is you're going to need a battery replacement. 
for any of these cameras. So right. um, because you're going to be using it for long periods of time, you want to be able to plug it in into AC power. So um, when you're working out your budget, make sure that you budget to, to get a, a battery replacement as well. Right. So you're, my, you're probably looking at six to $700 to get into that. Okay. Yeah. I'm using a Sony ZV-1 now that doesn't mm -hmm. have an, Sony doesn't make a battery replacement. Some third party okay. company does. And I was all scared about, you know, yeah. setting it on fire. The other thing I noticed is that I can't put it on a, a tripod. Oh, because, because, the battery... because, because where the battery door is and the battery door doesn't close with a wire hanging out of it. So I had to get a special rig to move everything over. Yep. So, yep. I mean, part, partly my experimentation is like, I'll buy a thing and then a week later I'll have bought all the other things that I need to make the first thing work. Right. Right. And that's, and that's fairly typical at this point. Um, it's, it, it's, you know, we're a little bit out of the wild west. <laughs> I think, you know, the, the railroads have come through, but um, there's still, you still need to be either self-sufficient or um, go to a, a really reputable source like B&H Photo out mm -hmm. of New York. Um, they're experts at this. You, you know, you call them and they'll, you tell them what you need and they'll say, okay, here's, here's what you need and here's what you'll, you know, here's what will do the job for you. Um, uh, so yeah, I would, I would encourage people who are not quite sure if they want to go that route and not quite sure what they, what they need or, or how to get it set up, you know, going to somebody like B&H is going to be a, a good step to take. Very good. So. All right. So now we're way over the time and there's <laughs> like 12 more things I want to ask you about. So yeah, we could, we could do this again. Okay, that'd be great. I also want to know, like, do you, if do you teach people this? Do you have a course Next. or a program or a group? Like, I'd rather yeah. I'd rather let this be the, um, you know, the appetizer and sure. the free sample and let people find you sure. for the rest. So, so where is it? Speaker Springboard is uh, is my program, um, and that's the website speakerspringboard.com. Um, I so last year when the pandemic hit, I started holding free hour long workshops for speakers to help them understand some of these issues and to, to, to learn some of them were, you know, tech nervous, uh, help them understand the, the little things they could do to make, make their presentations better. And in doing those, uh, after a few times, uh, I realized that I had a lot more than would fit in an hour. Go, go figure. <laughs> <laughs> right um and so uh i actually developed an online course it's 10 modules um and it does some of these these technical things like microphones and backdrops and and cameras and lighting and all that stuff but it's also technique um talks about how to structure your presentations differently how to how to look at creating your slides for an online presentation versus what you would do on stage. Um, your presentation style, you know, not running around the stage like you would um, in, in, on an in-person event. Um, so it, it's techniques and, and it's, it's technology and techniques. Um, okay. It covers the whole thing. But um, I'm also offering, I'm, I'm, I'm holding free webinars once a month um anybody can sign up the two things is you know you need to register for it and the second thing is you got to show up because i don't do replays and i don't do replays because people don't pay attention to replays uh -huh, right. the, the engagement is lower um but uh the webinar runs about 45 minutes there's no hard sell in it i tell you about my program and what it costs and what it could do for you but it, there's no hard pitch in it and after 45 minutes, I take questions and answers, and I will stay until all the questions are answered. Uh, so so um, if you want it, the only way to get access to that is to be live. And so that's why I don't do replays. Okay. But so anybody people who can, wants, people can find all people can find all that at speakerspringboard.com. Okay, speakerspringboard.com slash demonstration will take you to the registration page. 
Okay. Slash demonstration. And I have two sessions on the third Thursday of every month. Um, one's at 10 o'clock Eastern and one's 2 p.m. Eastern. So there's the early one works for people in, in Europe. Um, mm. The later one works for people on the West Coast. Um, for my Australian friends, I'm sorry, but <laughs> we're still working on a way to find something that works for 12 hours apart. But uh -huh. um, though I have, have had folks from Australia get up at two o'clock in the morning to to attend one of these webinars. So, uh, uh, but yeah, it's it, you know it's fun, and you know we cover. Uh, some of the same ground that we've talked about here uh, and a bunch of other stuff. I talk about saber tooth tigers and sand and a bunch of interesting things. Um, but yeah, that's uh, uh, once a month, the, you know, that opportunity rolls around. Okay. Awesome. Well, so uh, I'll, I'll put all that in the show notes. I'm sorry. I didn't get to ask you about wearables. Maybe I can get you back on for a health tech uh, Definitely. conversation. Be happy to. Um, but anyway, Alfred Poor, um, so I've learned a lot. I hope the audience and I guess the, the vidians, because I really I really want people to watch this on YouTube because you, there's a lot of visual stuff here. There, there's one other thing I want to mention. In addition to the course, I do offer bespoke training. I mean, um, some companies may have a specific need for a team. So maybe they have a sales team that's doing a lot more virtual pitches and you know, they don't need the whole 10 course meal. You know, they just want to come in, tell us where we are. You know, I give me the three things that we can do that make a, a measurable difference in what we're doing, that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm available for that kind of work as well. Okay, great. I want to, I want to leave with one final question. Sure. Which is when I get the recording from Zoom of this present of this conversation, I get two video options. I get speaker where whoever is speaking takes up the full screen and I get gallery where you can see both of us. As far as I know, I have not picked my nose while you were talking. What, uh, I probably fidgeted a little bit. What do you recommend in terms of the sh sharing this recording? So that's a good question. One of the things is with, I'm slightly off centered by nature. <laughs> so but also as you see in the frame i'm i'm off center um so depending on how it crops the image uh in the side by side view um it may not as, look as good to have me cropped um mm. so maybe speaker. so the zo zoom will give us both you know it'll, it'll create a big uh, black bar above yep. and below so it'll give it to us it, it won't crop at all okay yeah, yeah. I mean, if it, yeah, if, if the side by side doesn't crop, I would probably go with side by side. Okay, but I mean, it's not like I was putting up any really detailed slides or things where people needed a close up to to uh -huh. see what I was doing. So I, I I would do I would try side by side. Okay, will do. That's that's what I've been doing just because it's been less work. But I was wondering. Yes. Well, for me, I download separate video and audio tracks and then go into my video editor and put the whole thing together um, separately. So I have control over what shows in it, but that, I'm just, I'm just obsessive that way. Right. Yeah. I'm not going to do a that. lot of work. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait till the times have changed and I can't get away right. with not. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, for my podcast, as short as it is, I only do audio just so I don't have to fuss with, with the video. Uh-huh. But right. Yeah. 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 I was going to do audio only, but then one of my, one of my podcasts on YouTube, like took off, like yeah. the algorithm blessed it. And now, so now I'm like, well, maybe this one too. So there you go. I literally spent go. five times as much time on the video that almost nobody watches. Right. Right. Well, that's, but, that's par for the course. Okay. Glad so, to hear it. Alfred Poor, thank you. So this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for sharing generously so much of your knowledge. Um, people can go to speakerspringboard.com to find out more and to, to get your training modules and bespoke training. And thank you so much. Really appreciate oh, it's, it. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, take care.